Uh, sure. Uh, I am the um, actually the director of informatics and biocomputing here at OICR. Uh, I work on uh, community uh, databases, knowledge bases such as uh, WormBase, and what I'll be talking about today is the Reactome database of human uh, biological pathways. Uh, so um, you've uh, you, you've you've talked about an enrichment of gene lists, and now we're going to go one step further on to uh, discover uh, your own relationships uh, or discover novel relationships among the genes in your gene set using <coughs> pathway network analysis. Okay. So the main motivation for uh, uh, for looking at biological pathways from the computational statistical point of view is a dramatic uh, reduction in the uh, in the data size. Instead of having thousands of individual genes uh, that may come out for, of your omics experiment um, uh, and uh, thousands of hypotheses about how uh, w uh, which ones may or may not be biologically significant, uh, pathway network analysis allows you to reduce that to dozens of pathways and reduce the number of hypotheses so that you can find biological processes which are enriched in your set of interest um, uh, with, uh, without the, penalt the penalty of uh, the multiple testing, uh, testing uh, correction. Uh, this, uh, it also allows you to look at a set of rare events such as the, the long tail of rare cancer mutations. Those of you who work in cancer know that if you look at mutations, there are only a few genes in any given um, uh, tumor type which are recurrently mutated, and then there are uh, hundreds of genes which are pres that are mutated in just a few percent of the population. You don't know whether those are passenger mutations, which have no significance, or driver mutations, which in rare instances are contributing to the tumor phenotype, pathway and network analysis can help you sift out the ones which are significant from the ones which aren't and discover the processes in which they participate. A similar problem pops up in rare germline mutations such as autism spectrum disease, which is in, uh, has a strong hereditary component, but uh, there are few, if any, genes which are commonly mutated in the disease instead of seems to be the uh, uh, driven by uh, uh, many, many different rare uh, uh, many different uh, rare uh, germline variants, and again, pathway network analysis has been used very successfully in this case to identify the underlying biological processes from this long tail. Uh, similarly, you can tell biological stories because you're working on well annotated, well understood biological pathways. Um, there's uh, literature backing up what uh, backing up the patterns that you're seeing, so that you can identify hidden patterns in long lists of anonymous sounding genes. You can uh, extract the pathways and build them to create mechanistic or um, quantitative models to explain your experimental observation. You can predict the function of an unannotated genes by identifying genes which are. Um, uh, uh, novel genes or poorly annotated genes which interact with well-known genes and start to make guesses about what those are doing uh, and uh, you, can you can identify molecular signatures using pathway network analysis by finding um, different sets of uh, patients or cell lines or whatever you're working on organisms which um, uh, are, differ in um, uh, differ one from the other at the pathway level and relate that to their phenotype. So I've been talking about pathway network analysis a lot. I haven't actually said what it is. Uh, it's a very broad term. I, I, you, I define it broadly as any analytic technique that uses pathway or molecular um, uh, uh, interaction information to gain insights into a biological system very rapidly evolving field, a lot of different approaches, and uh, anything I say today will probably be out of date uh, in a year. So let's talk about what the difference between pathways and networks is. 
So a pathway is uh, it, 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 the there are basically two ways of looking at the same data set. Um, the pathway related the pathway related view is the traditional view that you learned in biochemistry 101 from uh, Leninger, uh, where you have a linear or branching set of biological reactions uh, involving proteins or lipids or small molecules or metabolites. And they're organized end to end in a way that seems to have some directionality. You can, you, there's an upstream portion and a downstream portion. And it relates to causality. And it's a great way of uh, understanding what the system is doing in a teleological way it probably doesn't actually relate to the way cells see the uh, see um, what's going on inside them, which is probably much more complex and branching and uh, looping and interacting. But it's a good way for us to organize the knowledge. So in the pathway-oriented view of the uh, uh, epidermal growth factor receptor, let me see if the mouse here is, is, is going to work for me. No, this mouse doesn't work. This one works. Is my cursor visible to you? Yeah, you can see it. Okay, we have the um, we have a reaction center here. This is where the reaction occurs, and we have two inputs into the reaction. We have the EGFR receptor, and we have the EGF ligand, and they um, interact with each other to form the EGF EGFR complex. And this reaction is regulated, negatively regulated in this case, by a protein called LR1G1. And, and in fact, this is a very simplified uh, view. There are many different regulators of this reaction. Uh, EGF and EGFR, then um, uh, two copies of this associate with each other to form a dimer. So the input here is, is the, um, the um, receptor ligand uh, monomer. There are two of them. They come together to form the dimer. Um, this then catalyzes a reaction in which ATP is converted into ADP, uh, and a, uh, the output from that is a phosphorylated version of EGF, EGFR. You shouldn't have to take notes on this. Uh, this is just an illustration. And it's positively regulated by a, um, uh, a protein uh, product from the SRC1 gene. Okay, so this is, and then this, um, uh, this pathway uh, continues and continues and continues until you finally get stimulation of mitosis and, and cell growth. Okay, if we look at this in a network fashion, however, um, the, uh, uh, we've reduced each of these uh, uh, genes and protein products and small molecules into a series of interacting uh, 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 entities. Um, in this type of view, there's our, our nodes, which are the circles, and there are uh, edges, which are the, uh, um, the, the various uh, uh, arrows and lines that indicate intera interaction. So in this view, EGF um, activates CGFR. Um, it is the, the, uh, these two are inhibited by LRG1, uh, and I believe this is... Uh, drawn incorrectly, but EGFR um, is, uh, is uh, activated, the, the uh, EGFR uh, ligand is activated by SHC1. This arrow should probably be pointing the other way. Just notice that for the first time. Uh, the nice thing about a network is that you can start to put in less well understood interactions. So if we have, say, uh, proteomics communal precipitation data that says that KRT17 and EGF co-immunoprecipitate, uh, we can put in um, interaction uh, um, uh, edges, which indicate that there, there is some sort of physical or genetic interaction going on here. We don't know exactly what, but it's, a, it's, it's useful to have that bit of information in there. Okay, so the advantage of the pathway-oriented view is it's easy to comprehend by people the advantage of the network-oriented view is it's, it's, a machine, it's a simplified data model, it's machine-readable, and you can, do model, uh, you can do mathematical modeling on, on uh, this type of network. So, for, uh, so now we're going to get down to the practicalities of working with uh, pathways and networks. So to, uh, 
To do any type of pathway network analysis, you need two things. You need uh, a list of genes, proteins, RNAs from your experimental system. Um, and uh, this, so these can be uh, genes that are, these can be uh, uh, variants in a genetic screen that you've identified or associated with a phenotype. They can be um, up or down regulated genes in an expression uh, a data set. It can be microRNAs in a, um, uh, in a small RNA sequencing experiment, et cetera, and so forth and so on. Uh, and you need uh, a, a, a database of pathways or networks. Okay? And then you need a tool that will, will combine the two and tell you how they're related. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about databases, da the databases first. Uh, so there are, um, there, there, there are basically two types of, uh, of sources for network pathway information. One are um, our pathway databases, which are oriented towards this human view of, um, uh, of biological networks. And the other are network databases, which are the machine, which give you the machine readable view. Um, the uh, uh, primary examples of the former the, uh, uh, the, the pathway databases, which are, is confusingly labeled here reaction network databases, because that's a formal, formal description, are reactome and uh, cake databases. These, are, um, uh, these databases uh, describe biological processes as a series of biochemical reactions in the way that um, I showed you in the EGFR example. Uh, and they're able to represent um, many, uh, uh, if not most, of the events and states found in biology. Um, here, this is an example of the, uh, the reactome database uh, data model, which shows the, 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 the fundamentals of the data model is centered around a reaction. A reaction can be modulated by a, a regulatory uh, gene or protein or other small mo or, or a small molecule. Um, there can be a catalyst activity associated with a reaction, and a reaction converts a set of inputs into a set of outputs. Um, the inputs can be um, uh, uh, can be small molecules such as uh, sugar molecules and intermediary metabolism. Um, they can be uh, um, two proteins which are dimerizing. They can be a protease and its substrate. And the inputs then produce a series of outputs. So if you wanted to, if you're talking about a proteolytic cleavage event, the input would be the un one, there would be one input, the uncleaved protein. The, catal the, the, um, the catalyst would be the protease involved. And the outputs are the two cleaved products of the, um, uh, of the original protein. If you're talking about a membrane, um, uh, a transmembrane signaling event, the input is the um, the unactivated version of the protein. The outputs are the active is, is the, the the output is the activated version, um, and so forth. Um, and the uh, the other big database for pathway uh, information is KEG. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, a curated database compiled from published material. It includes information on all sorts of uh, small and large molecules across many, many different organisms. And it provides a, uh, a map uh, for how each of these is organized, how these are organized together. So here is a typical pathway diagram from KEG showing the cell cycle. And, uh, it's, um, it's, it's showing the various components of the, the cell cycle organized at, as a series of reactions in the way we showed you before. In this case, they use a little black dot, uh, black or open dots instead of the squares to show the reactions, but it's essentially the same thing I showed you before. Um, Reactome, uh, similar to KEG, is um, it's a pathway database. The main difference between KEG and Reactome there are a couple differences. Um, one is that Reactome focuses on very deeply curated human reactions, human pathways, and other organisms come along as come along for the ride, but are not directly curated. Uh, Keg attempts to do all organisms, so it's much broader but but shallower. 
And the other difference is that CAG has uh, uh, licensing restrictions. You're not, um, uh, it's not free for commercial use. Reactome is completely open source and open access. So Reactome covers um, pathways uh, for metabolism, signaling, other biological processes. Every pathway and every reaction is traceable to um, one or more references in the primary literature. And there's an editorial process which is, uh, ensures that there are, uh, there, there are multiple, uh, multiple references for key, for key observations. And each uh, pathway gets uh, um, reviewed, peer gets peer reviewed at uh, regular intervals, so that um, we have a pretty good we have pretty good sense that it's that what, what goes into the database is correct. Um, Reactum also uh, uh, is interlinked with many other online databases and provides built-in data analysis and visualization tools. Uh, here is an example of one of the visualization analysis tools in Reactome. Uh, it is a, uh, and you'll be, uh, uh, you'll be seeing, uh, Robin will be uh, uh, showing you something like this during the, uh, uh, during the workshop that follows. Uh, this is a, a Google map of um, a, uh, can't tell which pathway this is. This is this is double-stranded brake repair pathway. Um, what you're seeing on the left side is a uh, uh, a hierarchical list of pathways, sub-pathways, and sub-sub-pathways. On the right is a scrollable and panable window that you can kind of drag around and zoom in and out of, which shows you details in the pathway. And we've projected a gene set onto this pathway. Um, to show uh, where the upregulated and downregulated genes in your experimental set are, so um, this is a here is an upregulated gene in the gene set. Here's a downregulated one. I believe this is an R, This was an mRNA set, and here is a complex of multiple genes that have some upregulated and some downregulated components in the gene set, um, and statistics uh, from the enrichment analysis below. So in the very basic usage of this, you have a gene set, you have a set of genes like you had, uh, like you're, you've been using yes, yesterday. Um, you upload this into Reactome. It does an enrichment analysis for you, tells you which pathways are enriched in your gene set, and then you can zoom into this and see how the altered genes are related to each other within each of the um, enriched pathways. Uh, in addition to Reactome and KEG, there are about 1,900 other sources for um, pathway pathway information. Some of them very uh, some of them very boutiquey, um, focusing on in great depth on uh, um, uh, certain certain pathways. Others more broad. Um, there's a great resource called the Pathway Commons, in which multiple databases submit their pathways in a uniform format called Biopax, and then this resource uh, um, allows you to search through them. So you can, uh, uh, you can, uh, if you're interested in a particular pathway, you can find the best curated and deepest one by doing some searches on Pathway Commons. It also provides some uh, tools for comparing one group's view of a pathway to another, and you're doing um, uh, uh, simple enrichment analysis. Okay, so that's those are pathways. Now we're going to talk about networks. So uh, pathways are great for people, but they're really lousy for uh, for doing computation computation over it. Generally, it has to be simple. The data model has to be simplified in order to uh, start to do start to do statistics and make models that a, that a computer can deal with. Typically, uh, what our, inter our, net our the networks that we work with in, bio in biology are interaction networks, and these are a collection of nodes in which the nodes are genes, proteins, lipids, RNAs, etc., uh, connected by edges, and the edges um, describe the uh, uh, the nature of the interaction between them. So there can be undirected edges where there's a mutual reciprocal reaction, two proteins are binding to each other. 
There's no particular di directionality of that, that. In network diagrams, that would be indicated as a, uh, a line without an arrow. There can be positive or negative regulatory re reactions indicated by a, uh, an arrow. So a typical example would be a transcription factor. Transcription factors uh, a relationship to a gene whose expression it, um, uh, it activates. The transcription factor would, would, would be one node. The RNA would actually be the, um, the second node and one and the the transcription factor is activating the RNA by increasing its its expression. Uh, a uh, a catalyst would have a positive regulatory uh, edge. A whereas a um, uh, say a, a, a ubiquinylation reaction would have a negative regulatory uh, uh, effect, and that would be. Um, shown as a um, line with a little bar on the end. Okay, um, so uh, you, uh, as you can tell from the examples I gave you, the edges could be physical interactions, they can be functional relationships, um, they can be more abstract things like co-expression relationships. You know there's a genetic relationship between two genes because they go up or down uh, in synchrony with each other. Basically, any sort of relation can be expressed with this simple model. And there are a bunch of different types of common interaction networks that you'll run into. Uh, transcription regulatory networks is a good example. Metabolic networks, uh, where you have a series of enzymatic activities and uh, their relationship to the small molecules that they, uh, uh, whose reactions they catalyze. Protein-protein interactions is a major one. You'll see a lot of them. Uh, and then there are um, uh, higher order networks such as disease networks where each of the nodes is a disease and they're connected to each other on the basis of, uh, for example, sharing uh, uh, sh uh, the number of genes that they share in common if they're genetic diseases. Okay. Virus. Here's another example of virus host network. I have a, uh, a virus that can infect multiple hosts or a host that can be infected by multiple different viruses, you can show those relationships. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Anytime. Can some, you want me to go back? Yeah. yeah. Can we get some from that reference? Can we get the uh, pointed to, for example, I would be interested in virus host networks? So we can find that in that reference? Yeah, the question is Does the Barbasi review talk about um, virus host networks? Yeah, I believe this was stolen out, this, this figure was stolen out of that review. Um, it was stolen out of that review, uh, and, and uh, it is one of the examples. It's actually a, a great. It's a. Um, uh, it's a great review of uh, how you build networks and what they can be used for. And uh, Mark Vidal is the first author. He's sort of the father of um, high throughput um, uh, uh, physical interaction screens. And uh, Barbasi is a mathematician and cancer oncologist who uh, does a lot, of, uses network analysis in his uh, uh, in his work. Yeah. So you need to get uh, you need to get network data uh, uh, from a database, just like you do pathway information. Network databases um, can be built automatically or via curation. Uh, the, um, if they're curated, you have a team of curators that goes into the literature and pulls out papers that report um, physical or genetic interactions. Uh, if they're built automatically, it's usually coming from high throughput experiments, yeast to hybrid experiments, proteomic uh, co immunoprecipitation experiments, um, the uh, co expression data. Uh, and many network databases use both sources of sources of information. Uh, typically, a network database has more extensive coverage of biological systems. The largest pathway databases uh, cover no more than half the genome. Network databases can cover much more, but a lot of the associations that they report are false positives from the high throughput experiments. So you need to be you need to keep that in mind. Uh, and uh, yeah, then the next point is the 
relationships and the underlying evidence are more tentative typically than the pathway data the, than the pathway databases because the nature of the interactions is less well understood. Um, there are, again, like the pathway databases, there are multiple sources for curated networks. Um, the uh, uh, they, uh, each of the network databases, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, share with each other or steal from each other. Um, you know, so you you have to be um, you have to take some of this with a grain of salt. They're not completely completely uniformly curated. Uh, the, by the, the three which are uh, kind of recommended here are uh, BioGrid, Intact, and Mint. Uh, each of them has a different number, has different curation um, uh, standards. Um, BioGrid uh, aims to, uh, go, covers multiple organisms but is relatively shallow. It has 529,000 genes and 167,000 interactions. Intact is much deeper and focuses on human, so it has 60,000 genes and 203,000 interactions. You can see it's kind of a dramatic difference in the gene to interaction ratio. Uh, and Mint is, is smaller, but even but deeper still, 31,000 genes and 83,000 interactions. We'll just um, look at a typical, a typical uh, interaction database will give you an interface like this one. You search for a gene of interest, in this case P53, or TP53, and it came up with 7,708 interactions for P53 that have been uh, uh, mined out of the literature, but notice that most of these uh, interactions are actually um, published high-throughput experiments. So these are a series of co-immunoprecipitation experiments, this actually came out as supplementary data published in the paper. Right. Okay, so um, often the, your choice of the source of the data is, not, is going to be dictated by um, the, uh, the tool that you use, and some tools have been tuned to work with particular data sets. Others are more general and will give you the option of populating it with a data set that you have, uh, an interaction or pathway data set that you've downloaded, or even one that you created yourself, and will give you some flexibility. Okay, so I'm going to talk now about the tools that one uses uh, to implement pathway network analysis. And so this is from a, this is a figure from a Nature Methods paper that um, uh, I helped write with a bunch of other uh, authors from the um, uh, International Cancer Genome Consortium, and it just got just got accepted over the weekend. So I'm happy about that. After about a year of trying to get it get it accepted to Nature Methods, um, we broke down uh, pathway network analysis into three different um, categories. The first is the one that you did yesterday: enrichment of fixed gene sets. And in this um, this type of analysis. You start out with a um, um, you start out with a series of um, uh, of predefined fixed gene sets, such as go uh, uh, go subcellular location terms or go um, uh, biological process uh, groups, and then you do an enrichment and, and then you do an enrichment analysis, and then you can supplement this by uh, by, by using uh, uh, um, uh, pathway database uh, uh, colorization. So the example that I showed earlier in which we uploaded a gene list into Reactome, it found overrepresented pathways and then showed you a, a colorized picture. That's, that's basically what we're, we're, we're showing here. Um, the second type is uh, de novo, and so we're not going to talk about uh, uh, fixed gene set enrichment um, uh, any, anymore because you've already, you're already familiar with it from yesterday. The second type, um, which is what you're going to focus on in the workshop, is de novo subnetwork construction and clustering. In this, um, uh, in this style of analysis, you start out with a large interaction network. These are typically done on networks. Um, and present the network 
with a list of genes that came out of your experiment. And the algorithms will attempt to identify non-random groupings of the genes in your gene set, pull them out of the network, and try to build a, a sub-network around them which shows how they relate to each other. Um, if your, uh, if the, your, your uh, genes or proteins or other small molecules are related to each are, are, are related to each other it will find non-random clustering pull it out if they're just a random gene set they'll be scattered all around the interaction network and you won't get anything out that will make much sense and what this allows you to do um, is to identify uh, new relationships that are not do not necessarily correspond to classic pathways that are hidden inside your uh, your data set and to identify subtypes um, in um, in your data set which relate to relate to biology. Um, then the last uh, and most sophisticated type of uh, um, of uh, analysis is uh, call uh, is pathway based modeling, where you go back where um, the algorithm is actually built around a uh, a computational model of how each um, part of the uh, each uh, entity in the network is related to the others. So it pre preserves the catalyst and re positive and negative regulatory relationships and attempts to predict, given a series of experimental observations, such as mutated genes or RNA expression changes, what the downstream effects of that combination of alterations will have. And so this will give you the ability, the, these attempt to uh, predict the integrated effect of multiple alterations in a quantitative fashion. What are these three methods good for? Well, the enrichment of fixed gene sets should always probably always be the first thing you turn to. Um, a, typical, uh, a, a typical question that you, uh, that you can use to, that these, this is good for is asking what biological processes are altered in whatever you're studying, in my cancer, or in my perturbed cell line, um, or um, in my um, uh, cases, versus cases versus controls. And that usually, it usually sets you off in the right, right direction. For de novo subnetwork construction clustering, you can ask if new previously undescribed pathways are altered in this cancer or data set, and are there clinically relevant uh, subtypes um, within, uh, within the data set. Can we, can we distinguish one patient population from another patient population based on which subnetworks are activated or inactivated? In pathway-based mo um, modeling, um, you can go down to the personal genome level, given a, so I'm, I work in cancer, so all my examples are in cancer, sorry. Uh, in a particular patient who has a series of mutations and hypermethylation of a, a gene resulting in a series, of, a series of RNA expression changes and protein changes, what is the downstream integrated effect of all those changes? And can I find, can I make predictions of what drugs I can give the patient to take advantage of these changes or reverse, re reverse these alterations? So, okay, enrichment of gene sets. Um, not going. This is covered in module three. This was taken from a. a oh, <laughs> it's so interesting. I didn't didn't fix this since last week when I gave the cancer genome uh, uh, genome talk. Uh, it's the most popular form of pathway network analysis. Easy to perform. Great end user tools. Statistical model is very well worked out. The disadvantages are um, there are many possible different ways of slicing and dicing. Uh, gene sets, uh, so you have to choose which ones to use or look at multiple ones. Uh, the gene sets are typically uh, heavily overlapping, and when you get an enrichment result, you'll 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 get a series of hits in uh, in in gene sets which may actually be related to each other. So you have to do another round of inspection or analysis to merge things that are related together. Um, so you may get for example, cell cycle and cell cycle checkpoints coming up as 
two hits, and you have to realize that those are probably related to the same un underlying changes. Uh, and finally, um, you have uh, when you look at uh, genes as a, as a series of bags, there may be regulatory relationships within those bags that you're not able to see, such as you know a increase in a um, in, in a um, uh, an upstream activator of a pathway coupled with a decrease in an inhibitor. You may they, they'll both appear in the same bag, but you may not uh, be able to see that without further inspection. Um, and uh, so now we're going to talk about uh, in a little more detail de novo subnetwork construction and clustering. Uh, basically, you're applying a list of altered biological entities to, the bio to a biological network and finding topologically unlikely configurations. Um, typically, this is measured as finding as, uh, clusters of altered genes that are closer to each other in the network than you would expect by chance. And uh, there are various ways of measuring this. Typically, the, the, main, the, the main way is the, sh the average shortest path among them, which is counting up the number of hops uh, between each pair and then averaging those shortest paths. Uh, you can then extract cluster, the clusters of these uh, unlikely configurations to make subnetworks, and then you can annotate them using gene set enrichment, in fact, to, uh, to identify which biological processes correspond to these, uh, um, these clusters of gene networks that you've found. So clustering is a... Um, uh, 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 is the process of uh, grouping the uh, biological uh, entities into uh, small communities such that the members of these clusters uh, or communities uh, are, um, uh, are more connected with each other than they are with, uh, uh, with uh, entities that are outside the cluster. Uh, the um, as you would expect, if the interaction network is any good, uh, highly connected proteins share similar properties. Uh, um, typically, um, they'll be members of the same pathway, or they'll be members of the same um, uh, uh, molecular complex, or they'll be members of the same uh, uh, set of uh, uh, set of um, uh, genetic regula uh, genetic uh, regulatory interactions. There are uh, a large number of ways of clustering, and this is actually the main difference between uh, the, the, the major difference between um, different uh, network analysis algorithms. Um, the oldest and most widely used clustering algorithm is um, uh, um, is one that was developed by Gervin and Newman. Uh, a couple of decades ago for use in analyzing the World Wide Web um, to find uh, communities of uh, related users. Um, it's uh, very accurate but a little slow. Um, m now there's uh, a f uh, many algorithms now use a faster one, faster but less accurate uh, algorithm called Markov clustering. Um, both Gervin, Newman, and Markov clustering um, have a um, uh, have a problem with ascertainment bias. If you have a gene which is uh, has a lot of interactions going into it or coming out of it, like p53, um, p53 and other highly related genes will always form a cluster and it will come out as a false positive in your data set. And the only reason for this is because p53 has been so heavily studied that there are a lot of interactions in the literature. And so there have been a number of, of uh, corrections applied to this. The one that in practice works, uh, works quite well is an algorithm called HotNet, written by Ben Raphael at um, Brown University, which models the network like a metallic uh, metallic lattice, and then applies um, and then applies heat to um, to different points of the network uh, to indicate gene activity. So, if you have done a microarray experiment and you find that a gene is upregulated 
in the model, you, um, uh, you make the upregulated gene hot, and downregulated genes you make cold, and then the algorithm uses heat diffusion uh, equations to diffuse this activity out among the network. And the, 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 the way it, the, um, it helps with highly connected genes like p53, because p53 has many, many wires coming out of it, and the heat diffuses more rapidly. So it corrects to some extent for the ascertainment, ascertainment bias. And it's kind of mysterious why it, why it should work, but it actually produces uh, biologically intuitive um, results. So people like it. I like it. Uh, these three algorithms and others have been incorporated into a large and ever-growing uh, uh, set of, uh, of clustering network, uh, cl um, clustering algorithms. Um, the two that I want to point out to you uh, are um, both implemented as cytoscape applications. And since you've used cytoscape yesterday, you can start using them now. One is called Hypermodules, written by um, uh, Yuri Raymond, who is a postdoc in um, Gary Bader's lab. Uh, and uh, this, is, this, this identifies network clusters um, that correlate with uh, clinical characteristics or other phenotypic uh, characteristics. So if you are trying to find a cluster of genes which is, is associated with response to a drug in a patient or a, or a cell line or a mouse, um, this will weight the clusters to, for those that are associated with that phenotype. Very useful. And then the Reactome um, uh, Functional Interaction Network Cytoscape app, also known as Reactome FIVIS, um, offers multiple clustering and correlation algorithms, including HotNet and Markov clustering and Gerdman Newman, um, designed to work specifically on the, uh, the Reactome um, uh, FI network. Um, and it's kind of a Swiss Army knife for doing this type of de novo extraction and analysis. And uh, you'll be using it this after, this uh, later this morning um, and seeing the, uh, the demo. Uh, uh, you'll be using it in your exercise, and uh, Robin will be demoing it. So here's the typical output of a network clustering algorithm. We started out with a much, much bigger network. Uh, then the algorithm extracted the, uh, the, mem the, the members of the gene list that you gave it, and may also extract other genes which are related to the ones, highly connected with the ones you gave it, but aren't actually in your data set. And then uh, each cluster gets marked in a different color. You can, uh, you can draw, uh, I can draw uh, uh, polygons around it, and then annotate them according to what biological processes are enriched in them. Uh, I highly recommend a particular um, uh, interaction network, um, the one, uh, the, the Reactome Functional Interaction Network. It is, uh, um, yeah, this is basically a repeat of things that I've said, but it, it is, it is uh, um, um, a, a kind of a, a, be, a, a good compromise between curated and uncurated gene sets. Um, we'll going to skip through this and just talk about how the FI network was constructed. Uh, we started out with a series of pathway databases and converted each pathway into a network based on a, an extraction procedure that's uh, shown here, but I won't go through it. Um, to set to create a, uh, a set of annotated functional interactions covering around um, about a third of the genome. And then we added to this um, a set of high throughput data sets taken from a number of network uh, interaction databases, uh, the literature and other and high throughput data sets. It includes things like the, the transcription factor map from ENCODE, a bunch of protein-protein interactions in various species, uh, go, sharing of Go biological processes, and then used a machine learning technique, naive Bayes classifier, to remove most of the false positives from the set. 
and then we took the curated functional interactions and the predicted functional interactions and combined them together into a single very large functional interaction network spanning about half of the human genome. And we update this every year. As of the last release at the end of 2014, there were a total of uh, 11,780 proteins in this, um, in, in this data set, about half from pathways and half predicted from uh, high throughput experiments, covering roughly 58% of the genome, and there are 30, 336,000 functional interactions there, so it is quite a large network. So the way you, um, the way you do de novo subnetwork extraction and clustering so you start out with the, the functional interaction network, which the tools download for you uh, behind the scenes. This is showing just a little bit, little corner of the network. It's much larger than this. Uh, present it with your genes. The, these are uh, um, uh, up and down regulated genes, for example, in a uh, expression, microarray expression experiment. The uh, algorithm finds out where they are in the network. It connects them, and then optionally, if you wish it to do so, it will identify linker genes, which are um, interconnecting the genes in your gene set, forms a network with those, and then uh, extracts a subnetwork which relates your genes and the linker genes to each other, and you proceed from, you proceed from there. Here's an example of this at work. Um, this is from a couple of years ago when we started sequencing pan pancreatic cancers at OICR. Here's a typical, this is the first 52 genomes that we did. And uh, this is a typical uh, look at um, somatically mutated genes. There are a couple of genes which are highly frequently mutated in the data set. KRAS is, is, is mutated in 90% of patients, P53 in about 60%. And then there's this long, 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 long tail of things that are only mutated once or twice. This goes on for a long, a long way to the right. Um, looking at this or doing gene set enrichment analysis, um, you know, it doesn't, uh, um, uh, doesn't tell you much, um, but you can do a subnetwork um, uh, extra, uh, extraction and clustering to get a picture like this one. And what this is showing pretty clearly is that there are a series of highly interacting uh, uh, modules, um, each centered around one of those uh, high-frequency driver genes. Here's KRAS, and then there's uh, mutations in a whole series of other genes which interact with KRAS, and uh, they're interacting with KRAS more frequently than you would, ex and, and with each other more frequently than you would expect by chance. And in, it, it also includes members of the, um, uh, the ERB, FGF, and EGFR pathways, as well as some unexpected things such as axon guidance. The second largest module uh, in, involves a, a number of infrequently mutated genes uh, involving um, uh, participants from the hedgehog and TGF beta signaling pathway and so on and so forth. The interesting thing about this is that we're now up to about um, 450 genes and the module map hasn't, uh, sorry, 450 patients that we've done sequencing on or combined our data set with other, with other groups. Um, and we get the same module map that we did when we had 50. So there's a lot of information embedded in this that you can make use of even at very small numbers. Now we can then ask, um, are all, if we map these modules onto patients, are there differences from one patient to one donor to another? Um, so what we did is for each of our, each of our donors, we, uh, we looked at the mutations in that particular donor, mapped them onto the modules, and scored each module according to how many genes in that module were mutated in that patient. And you get this really kind of cool thing out of this, what we're showing is um, the, uh, we, we're showing patients going down and modules going across. The color indicates um, for each patient uh, how many genes in that module were mutated in that patient. And we did some adjustment for a uh, total number of mutations. 
and we get a very clear pattern of four different tumor types. One which is negative for modules uh, 1, 2, and 10. One which is uh, positive for uh, 1, 1, 2, and 10. One that's positive in 2 and 10 only, and so on and so forth. Um, the uh, you know, next thing to, uh, so we've actually looked at these. These are, these are KRAS negative patients. There's a, there are a bunch of interesting findings in here. Um, you can then look among these uh, tumor types to see if there's a difference in, um, in, in phenotype. And in some cases, you find it, in others, you don't. If you look in pancreatic cancer, the main finding is that uh, p patients who with, tum with tumor type 1 have a much longer overall survival, but it's a very rare um, it's a very rare phenotype, as you can see here. It actually turns out to be patients who have mismatch repair deficiencies. Um, but in other cases, such as here's an example in breast cancer, and I don't my picture has disappeared. I don't know. It was here. It was here last week when I gave this talk. That's odd. Anyway, there's a, it's supposed to be a picture of a. Uh, a this is a um, the same experiment done on estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Uh, where we're looking at expression levels of genes. Um, ER positive breast cancer, typically these patients have a very good prognosis, have long survival, have good response to um, uh, estrogen uh, receptor inhibitors, um, uh, but a few patients don't do so well. And uh, we, did a, we did an analysis comparing um, uh, 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 across a series of 500 um, uh, uh, um, uh, tumor microarrays and identified a module that's highly variable among the, the groups. And it's, um, I, I don't have the picture to show you, but it's a, um, uh, involves Aurora B kinase plus um, uh, uh, the um, uh, 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 my, uh, plus um, uh, uh, mitosis, uh, my mitosis related uh, related pathways, and if the gene is uh, if this mo if the genes in this module there are about thirteen genes in the module if they have high expression, the patients have much worse survival than those who have low expression in the members of this pathway. Um, in in fact, the difference is such that um, this group of patients has the same prognosis as patients with triple negative disease, which is um, uh, the, the kind of the, the, the worst subtype. So we found a, 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 you know, a, a very strong biomarker for, um, of prognosis based on, uh, based on a network analysis. And uh, at the time this was published, it was the strongest such biomarker that had been found. Um, it was not obvious by looking at uh, by looking at a gene at, at a gene at a time. Okay, the last topic we're going to talk about is um, pathway-based modeling, where you apply again you apply a list of altered genes, proteins, or RNAs to a bio, to biological pathways. The um, uh, these algorithms attempt to keep the detailed uh, regulatory information that's present in the uh, in the path present in the pathway database, and unlike any of the other techniques, um, these modeling techniques allow you to take different types of molecular alterations and look at them look at their effects together. Uh, so, for example, you could you could profile a um, uh, profile a patient population in which you have genomics data, expression data, copy number changes, methylation changes, small RNA changes, and put them together into the model and have it predict how together these changes are going to affect the um, uh, uh, pathway activities. And this is where pathway modeling starts to shade into uh, systems biology, cell and uh, cell modeling. Uh, there are uh, multiple, this is actually a law, this, this field has a long, long uh, heritage. It goes back 40 years to partial differential equations uh, performed on, on uh, bacteria and yeast growing in fermentation chambers where people use 
um, enzyme kinetics, KMs and uh, KIs to uh, um, to model the, uh, the 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 rate of consumption and production of metabolites. Um, the um, the, the oh, there's an online version uh, online uh, uh, PDE that you system that you can use called CellNet Analyzer that works quite well, but it's really designed for biochemical uh, systems, not for higher ordered uh, signaling uh, or regular or cell regulatory um, uh, pathways. Um, also, these PDEs um, don't work very well when you get more than a couple of dozen of genes or proteins involved. Um, they, they no longer become tra uh, computationally tractable. Uh, the second class of pathway-based models are called network flow models, um, which model uh, information flow through uh, a pathway or pathways. These are best developed uh, for the analysis of kinase cascades. NetForest and Network Kin are both um, Netherlands-based uh, web, web services that are designed for, uh, act, uh, for analyzing uh, protein uh, uh, kinase and phosphorylation uh, data sets. Uh, then there's a large class of ne network-based reconstruction methods designed at identifying the transcriptional uh, hierarchy, the transcriptional regulatory hi hierarchy uh, from, uh, uh, from sets of expression arrays. These enable you to find master regulators, for example, in a uh, system of perturbations. You can identify the top level transcription factor which, is, which regulates um, uh, all the changes below. And the exemplar of this is Arachne from, um, the, uh, uh, from Andrea Califano's group at Columbia University. Uh, it is specifically designed for the case where you have uh, RNA-seq or, um, or array data uh, across the same system where you have uh, at least a hundred perturbations. So for example, um, B cells that have been treated with a hundred different drugs uh, and you've done expression profilings on that, you can present that to Arachne and it will identify the transcription factors which are driving uh, all, all the variation across those perturbations. Uh, and lastly, there's um, uh, the, the most recent uh, type of models are probabilistic graph models, um, which um, uh, it attempt to build up a uh, um, uh, build what is called a Bayesian network, where you have a series of um, uh, series of uh, um, uh, ma um, nodes, mo molecules, which influence, influence the others and attempts to propagate the influences from the, the top down. The um, uh, most advanced version of this is a system called Paradigm that was developed by Josh Stewart at um, a, um, uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, and widely used for cancer analysis at this time. Uh, we're going to talk about um, paradigm in a little bit more detail because it's been built into a Cytoscape app. So um, the way uh, PGMs, PGMs are designed to allow you to integrate multiple omics data types onto the same pathway. Uh, so you can take copy number changes, RNA expression changes, mutations, proteomics data. Um, uh, you could, um, yeah, you can uh, uh, explicitly look at activated phosphorylated versus inactivated non-phosphorylated versions of proteins and it will identify, it will integrate those, uh, these data together and make predictions on which pathways are changed and tell you whether they're upregulated, downregulated, or not changed. And then you can take those pa uh, 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 pathway activities and relate them to the phenotypes, uh, clinical or experimental phenotypes of interest. Here's a simplified view of how Paradigm works. It starts out with a really a traditional pathway. Um, here's P53 and it has a negative regulator, MDM2, and downstream of P53 there are multiple other steps and finally it leads to 
uh, uh, apoptosis. In paradigm, paradigm explicitly models the central dogma. So for MDM2, um, there's the MDM2 gene. It drives production of the MDM2 RNA, which drives production of MDM2 protein, which then is activated to become the active protein, which then negatively interacts with uh, P53, which again goes from gene to RNA to protein to uh, P53 active protein, which eventually leads to apoptosis. Each of these steps has a weight associated with it. It's actually the probability that a twofold change in this entity will result in a n-fold change in uh, the in the downstream product. Uh, so using this model, you can you can model a whole bunch of things. You could have a mutation in the MDM2 gene, which will reduce the weight. You can have an mRNA change in the RNA, which will reduce the, the amount of RNA and will propagate down to the hair. You can have a copy number change in p53. It could be a deleted. You can have some mass spec information that indicates that the protein has changed. And by using the model, it will integrate them together and tell you, well, when you have all these changes, is apoptosis increased, decreased, or not changed very much? And this actually works quite well. Here's an example from cancer analysis of glioblastoma multiforme. Similar to the, um, the pancreatic map that I showed you before, these are different patients. Here are different, each row here is the, act, is the predicted activity of one of, the, uh, of one of the genes in the model. And you can see clear differences from one patient to another. Here's a group of patients who have uh, a decrease in GATA um, interleukin activity. Um, if you were to look at the individual mutations or RNA expression changes, you'd actually find a lot of heterogeneity in here. But no matter how they get, um, but they're brought by a variety of methods, they all, uh, these changes all lead to the same decrease in GATA IL2. Similarly, they have an increase in EGF, EGFR. So it's a very nice general technique, quite powerful. Uh, there are good and bad news about uh, Paradigm. The bad news is that it's uh, distributed in source code form. It's hard to compile. Um, it doesn't provide you with any, uh, any preformatted pathway models. You have to figure out how to put them in yourself. Documentation is um, almost non-existent, and it takes a long time to run. The good news is over the last over the last year, um, the uh, the Reactome team has put together a Cytoscape app that incorporates Paradigm. It's in beta testing now, and uh, it's still uh, under active development. But it automatically downloads and uses Reactome pathway-based models, um, and we've improved the performance of the original algorithm, so you can now use it um, interactively. So the tool that, that uh, Robin will be leading you through today, Reactome FIVIS, in addition to the, the uh, subnetwork extraction and clustering, which you'll be doing in your, in your workshop exercise, it also has experimental paradigm, paradigm support. So that's the end of the lecture. I've given you a whole bunch of URLs here. And uh, look for a... Um, uh, uh, look for a review article covering this in uh, Nature Methods coming up sometime in the next few weeks. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, Stephen. Yeah, um, it just uh, it may, may be totally irrelevant, but um, just with um, uh, the big network thing you put up before the heat map for your pancreatic cancer, yeah. I noticed the axon guidance came up and it yeah. made me um, wonder because I've seen axon guidance come up in a couple of different experiments. Yeah. And it makes me wonder if axon guidance, um, I'll choose this for as an example, but if axon guidance is actually relevant there, or if there are a whole lot of genes that have been documented that have been related to axon guidance that actually have a whole lot of other functions that we don't know about yet. Um, and how much, so I'm just wondering how much influence that has on this type of analysis. Yeah, so just to repeat for the, uh, for the recording, the question is, what is the relevance and meaning of axon guidance as module 5 for pancreatic cancer? 
Well, this so this first gate came up uh, quite a few years ago, and uh, I, w I was quite um, uh, quite surprised at Axon Guidance, and actually argued with my co-authors that we just couldn't call this thing Axon Guidance because the same genes are also involved in other. Uh, um, in other uh, biological processes, including angiogenesis. Um, but uh, um, it's driven really by, by robo-slit um, um, intera robo interactions, which are, are um, key for chemotaxis. And it actually is a, uh, a, a turns out that um, there's a correlation between mutations in this pathway and metastasis. And tumor tumor mobility, and you can actually show that you can um, cause the cells, uh, pancreatic cell lines, to become more mobile by knocking out certain components of this. So I think that in this case, um, you know, it's it's you know the the main problem is that the uh, the the name of the pathway is too specific. It's really not axon guidance, but more cell chemotaxis. Organ organogenesis, organogenesis organization, that kind of something along those lines would probably be a better way of describing it. Um, axon guidance genes have also come up in a uh, in quite a few other uh, tumors in recent years, so it's a, it's a real observation. Yeah, uh, Roger. So we have a lot of tools available. Some are discussed a bit more in the detail, others are out there. So. The uh, simple users and not how informed practitioners, when you recommend that we try a bunch of them, and we'll probably get different answers. How do you handle this? Just look what, what's common between what your findings are? Or? So the question is, what do you do when there are multiple tools and they're giving you different answers? Uh, in uh, in my lab, our standard operating procedures, we try uh, uh, we try several tools and then. Uh, we, uh, um, uh, we we try we first of all we, we try to validate the uh, uh, results before we put any confidence in them and if we're getting we, we seem to be getting uh, you know equally valid partial answers from each one we then uh, take the union or intersection depending on the circumstance not very not very systematic the systematic way is you benchmark everything against the gold standard set but um, particularly in this in this field, network analysis, it's usually not possible to do that. Okay, thank you very much. I'll be hanging around for about a half an hour. <laughs>